Thank you. Well, you know, one thing I can say that has not changed is, uh, for some strange reason, as soon as I got to the high school doors, I had this sudden urge to sneak a beer in. I don't know, it's kind of <laughs> weird. So, I actually, the, in the program, there's a topic I was going to talk about, which was uh, letting go of the fear of missing out. And, you know, kind of at the last minute, I said the rule of the night is change, and uh, who am I to break the rules? So about 48 hours ago, I scrapped the whole thing, and I'm going to talk about something kind of unrelated. So, um, so we got an eviction notice from our landlord, um, and it was probably a long time coming. Um, we had a rent control department in San Francisco, and if you know San Francisco, I mean, the rents are out of control. And they had doubled in the few years that we had lived in this apartment. The people living upstairs from us were paying twice what we were paying for the same apartment. So the landlord was kind of neglecting things, and they were just kind of letting everything go to pot. And so one day they finally served us with this eviction notice that was based on trumped up and false allegations that were obviously just a reason, an attempt to get us out. So one of the things that they said that, one of the allegations that they made was that I was revving my motorcycle at all hours of the night. So let me tell you about my motorcycle, okay? It is a 34-year-old Honda in bright orange that's about this high. It's got a 125cc engine. It's about an eighth the size of a Harley engine. So, I mean, it doesn't really sound like a motorcycle that you would be revving. And do I really look like somebody who would rev a motorcycle all night? <laughs> no. <laughs> better things to do. So in any case, you know, we, we, our plan had been to stay and to save some money to buy a house. And as we just learned from our last speaker, the real estate market is kind of tough these days. So we wanted to save up some money. And we said, you know, do we stay? You know, is this the time to leave? Is it the time to go and try to buy a house? We're not quite ready yet. And you know what? We said, we're out of here. We're not going to fight it. You know, this is, something's trying to tell us something. It's time to go. And so we bought a house. Then it was not exactly when we wanted to do it. It wasn't expected. It was a change in our plans. And we did it, and it turned out to be the best thing we ever did. So as you just heard, I'm a board-certified emergency physician. I had always been interested in emergency medicine. Um, I had a career as a paramedic before going to medical school. I kind of fell into that accidentally because I was interested in medicine and there was a little ambulance service and I kind of got involved and before I knew it, it was a whole career. Another kind of strange twist of fates and shifts that took me somewhere that I had not expected to go. I was studying, I don't know, each week was a different major in college, but the only thing that was consistent through it was that I was interested in this medicine stuff and the paramedic thing seemed interesting. So I went to medical school, and then it seemed intuitive to go to medical residency, emergency medicine residency, and that's what I did. And I trained in one of the top residencies in the country right down the street here at Harbor UCLA, and I got a fantastic education, and it was intuitive, and it made sense, and it was familiar, and it seemed to fit with where I was at that point. And it also fed this adrenaline addiction that I'd had my entire life. So kind of put that somewhere, and we'll come back to that. So, I finished my residency and I was working in this big, bad, mean, inner city urban trauma center for a couple of years, real organ grinder, as they would say, and um, something was just not right. You know, it took me a while, I just for a while felt like something just wasn't working, something just wasn't right. I didn't know what it was, and it's, I think people can relate to that. You know, sometimes you just feel unsettled. You know what it is? I think that I want to change what I'm doing with my life. But that's a really big deal. I mean, you, you go to medical school and you go do your residency, and I mean, it's like medicine is a coloring book, and you color within the lines, and you color within the lines in your book, you know. And you don't leave your book, you don't color outside the lines. It's it's kind of hammered into you, you know. I mean, medicine is kind of like the military, and I'm, you know, as you learn, the first thing I said was sneaking a beer into a school, so I don't really do well with rules. So. Um, I kind of woke up and I realized, you know, this is, this is not working. It's, the, it's, it's where I'm working isn't working for me. And the problem was that I personally felt in the emergency department that I was constantly plugging holes in this leaking dam. And what I realized that I wanted to do is I wanted to be building that dam. I wanted to be sitting in the room at the table with the people who are planning the design of that dam. So it's kind of two sides of the same thing. I wanted to do primary care. I wanted to do prevention. And because of that whole medicine coloring within the lines, when I started talking to my colleagues about this, people were just like, huh? 
what are you talking about? You're going to go do primary care? This is exciting. ER, you know, Dr. Carter, you know, everything. <laughs> and, 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 you know, you're going to go and, like, check blood pressures all day. And I was like, yeah, because I've spent the last, you know, X number of years in the emergency department, and I saw the results of failed primary care. You know, and, and so what had happened was that veil of the adrenaline was starting to get lifted off of my face because I was 32 years old and I'd finished my residency, my education was finished, and the, the education had been a convenient distraction, the adrenaline addiction had been a convenient distraction, and I was starting to be like, wow, you know what, what do I really want to do with my life now? I've kind of been on this path, and it's just kind of this path that I set, and it was adrenaline, and it's going, and distractions, and wow, and oh my God, I'm 32, what the hell am I doing with my life? And there were other irons in the fire too. So, like most women, by the age of three or so, I'd figured out that I was female, except the difference with me was that there were some anatomical cues to the contrary, and there was this M on my birth certificate. So, I'll kind of spell it out for those who don't get it, but, so, it was something that I had bottled up for quite a while, all through high school and through college, it was just kind of my own little secret, until I blurted it out one day while I was sitting at a stoplight in my friend's car. And she was a lesbian. We'd had a lot of conversations about a lot of different things, and I kind of took the calculated guess and risk that she would react positive, to, you know, affirmatively to it. So it's 2013 right now. If I last checked, that clock is ticking. So maybe it, maybe I'm talking too long, and it's next year already. But um, <laughs> it's. Uh, so it's 2013, you know, you can't like go to the checkout stand without seeing some kind of story about trans stuff. You know, it seems like all the TV talk shows are fighting over who's going to have the next trans person on. You know, it's kind of boring almost at this point. It's like, oh yeah, there's another trans person out there. So, but in 2000, in 1995, 1996, this is when I started coming out to people, this was a big deal. And it was an even bigger deal because, you know, there really were no like, lesbian, transgender, punk rock, you know, queer identified, you know, people running around out there. So let's all take a deep breath and be like, what did she just say? I'm totally lost. What, is this, are we in Redondo Beach? What is going on? So, so let's have like a little sidebar on like gender and sexuality and everything. And I'm realizing I'm going much longer than expected because I'm embellishing. So I hope that doesn't throw the program off. So, um, Let's have a little sidebar on sex and gender. So you have a gender. Let's think about that as a thing that's between your ears, that's in your brain. That's, that's how you, you see that you are. Then you have a physical sex. That's your body. That's like the container that you're in. And so what happens with transgender people is what's going on in their head and how they see themselves and what body they have is not lined up. They, they're, they're not together. And so there's two little X's that they put on the stage here that they told us to walk between and to stay in one or the other. And that's kind of interesting that they said to stay in one X or the other. Because gender, like many things in life, is actually a spectrum. So I'm kind of in the dark over here and I'm kind of over here. But if you say that this X is male and this X is female, and this is your gender identity. You know, I don't think there are too many people in this room who would say, I am right here or I'm right over there. I think people would say, you know, kind of in the middle. Transgender people are kind of the same. You know, I think there's an idea out there that transgender people are like, you know, I was a lumberjack and now I'm a live flight attendant or something like that. <laughs> but it's actually much more complicated. You know, and just like there are plenty of women who are tomboys and there are plenty of men who are effeminate, same thing. There are plenty of transgender women who are tomboys, etc. So, and then there's sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is totally unrelated to your gender. So who you're attracted to and what your kind of gender and body and everything, they're not really connected. And I think that people are starting to realize that, but there's still, you know, some ideas out there, you know, well, they're gay and so they're trans and it's all kind of related, but it's actually disconnected. So we can circle back into the story because now you might understand that it was kind of difficult to explain this back in 1996 because it's tough to explain it in 2013. When I was assigned male at birth, I transitioned to female. I'm attracted to females, so I'm a lesbian. So <laughs> stick that in your pipe and smoke. <laughs> so, so now we can get back on track. So, 
so I had that whole career thing that's driving me nuts. So now I have my gender thing that's driving me nuts too. So from 1996 until 2005, I had kind of bottled and figured out a way to kind of deal with this. I came out to most of my close friends and I kind of moved in this androgynous kind of way through the world, but I was still living as male. I was taking a kind of like a testosterone blocking medicine, but I wasn't really pursuing any kind of formal transition. And I needed to make some changes. So in the midst of all this, I'm thinking about my career, I'm thinking about my gender, and I realized that I was having a hard time finding a provider for my own transgender health care. So I was familiar with the statistics that 50% of all transgender people have to teach their own provider about health care. 40% of transgender people say that they have delayed seeking medical care because of a prior access to care that was unfavorable. They had a bad experience with the provider. So I said, hey, light bulb, magic connection, intersections of change, really fantastic. I said, I'm going to do primary care for transgender people. So thank you. <laughs> So, and I hadn't planned any of this, it just kind of came on me. You know, this is kind of like the universe shifting me and I'm just kind of going along for the ride. So I then had to figure out how to get malpractice insurance and all these people were like, what are you, emergency doctor, primary, transgender, what, what? And click. <laughs> so I, I finally found this insurance broker who was like, I mean, he was, he was, he was a senior citizen and was, had, he was the only person who would talk to me. And he was, <laughs> He had like a part-time office, like no cell phone. And he's like, yeah, I'll give you malpractice insurance. So I got a malpractice policy and then I had to find an office, which was really difficult because, you know, this was in Los Angeles in 2006 and it was, it was tough finding an office. It was, people were not interested in what I wanted to do. Finally found an office in West Hollywood. It was a little room about this big and it was in a suite and I shared the suite waiting area with a hypnotherapist and a video editor. And <laughs> So after, after, about, um, after about six months, I had enough intrepid patients who were brave enough to come see me in this place. Oh, the, the place next door was a DWI school. <laughs> so I had enough intrepid patients who came to see me, and uh, I, my, office got, my practice got big enough that I moved to a bigger office downtown, and I knew I had made the big time when my new neighbors were a modeling agency. So it's like, wow, you know, it's Los Angeles. So, after a couple of years, I got recruited by the LA Gay and Lesbian Center to help them establish a transgender health uh, program. And I now have 500 transgender patients in my care there. And in the middle of all this, another shift happened and I moved to San Francisco. So yes, now I'm bi-urban. So I live in San Francisco and I'm in LA two days a week. I come down here, Southwest has like a memorial wing in their corporate headquarters named after me. <laughs> so um, in San Francisco, I joined the team at the UCSF Center of Excellence for Transgender Health, where I now conduct research and I'm involved in establishing uh, a transgender health program there. So, you know, what am I trying to get at with all of this? You know, transition was difficult and making the professional shift was difficult. And I think it would be really easy and really self-congratulatory to stand here and be like, but I made it and I did it and it's great and everything is great. But you know what? It's not everything isn't great. It's tough, you know? I'm really happy, but you have to make these changes in your life sometimes when they come to you, and sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do, but when you go with them, it, it, it just, it lines up, it lines up, and so I have to deal with professional issues where people are saying, what are you doing what, with transgender medicine and emergency and what, what's going on? I have to make that explanation a lot of the time. My gender comes up, I have to explain it to people, and both of those things are going to be with me for the rest of my career and the rest of my life. But you know, sometimes you have to make the decision that makes you happy, even if it's not easy, and it's not always going to be perfect at the end. And so to kind of wrap up, you know, sometimes, just like with my landlord, we could have taken the right path. We could have fought them. We would have won. You know, I mean, you can't evict somebody in a rent control. We, we were right, and we could have won. But sometimes you don't choose the path that's right. You have to choose the path that makes you happy. And so sometimes it's best to heed some of those eviction notices that life tosses you. Thank you very much.